Well, thank you so much, uh, Avi, and thank you so much to our incredible uh, hosting organizations for putting this really important and necessary event on. Thank you to the National Writers Union, the News Guild, the Writers Guild of America East, Freelance Solidarity Project, Labor Notes, everyone who's who's helped make this event a reality. We so, so appreciate your hard work. And of course, thank you to all of you who are tuning in to watch um, and really, really want to thank our incredible panelists, Sarah, Kim and Braden, um, three remarkable journalists whose work I deeply admire, as I know all of you do as well. So I'm super, super excited to uh, dig into the questions that y'all submitted for this panel. Uh, super excited to learn as much as we can from our incredible panelists. So I'll keep uh, my introduction here short and sweet. Um, as, as Abby mentioned, my name is Maximilian Alvarez. I'm the editor-in-chief here at the Real News Network in Baltimore. I'm calling in from our main recording space uh, where you can catch, uh, you know, great productions that we put out every week, including the Chris Hedges report, the police accountability report, rattling the bars, um, labor reporting from me, and much, much more. Um, you know, I'm really honored to be moderating this this panel. Uh, you know, it speaks very deeply to um, issues that uh, I'm, you know, deeply concerned with and that are deeply wrapped up with uh, my own path to doing the work that I do now. When I was thinking about this event and meditating on the question of why labor reporting and good labor reporting is so necessary um, for, for working people to feel like they have a stake in the future of this country, of their jobs, of their communities, that they have it within themselves to be the agents of change in the world. I couldn't help but go back to, you know, a, a, a memory that sort of seared onto my brain from around 2010, 2011, uh, when I was working, you know, as a, as a temp in warehouses and factories in Southern California for 12, 13, 14 hours a day, uh, we as a family were in the midst of losing everything, including eventually the house that I grew up in. Um, and I remember distinctly coming home from work, just bone weary, tired, flopping down on the couch because I didn't really have energy to do much else. And watching the news that we had on all the time, it was just sort of this background noise in the house because we didn't want to sit and and stew in the silence uh, and, and feel our own failure and senses of shame. But when I would watch the news, I would feel shame nonetheless because I was constantly being told by pundits and politicians that the economy was back, that the recovery was happening. And, and all of these narratives were being spun, you know, as if like people in Washington, people on Wall Street, people above our heads were the ones making the decisions and the rest of us were just sort of there to experience, you know, whatever they gave to us. And that really, really, you know, made me feel alienated from the society that I was in. It made me feel like whatever recovery they were talking about didn't include families like ours and whatever solutions they were coming up with also didn't include us as, as part of that solution. Uh, it was really just a, pitched as a sort of technocratic adjustment to a world historical market crash that we were suffering the effects of, but that we were not being asked uh, you know, to, to participate in the recovery from. And I think that you know, 10 years, 11, 12 years later, I just think about how different the world and the country looks to me when I follow, you know, the work of, you know, the incredible journalists on this panel, as well as so many other incredible labor journalists uh, out there writing for outlets like Labor Notes, In These Times, Independent Outlets, you know, The Real News, so on and so forth. You get a very different sense of what the what's going on in the country and and who's involved in the making of change when you actually report on workers' struggles and when you report on them consistently and humanely and you lift up the voices of people on the front lines of those struggles, which is what uh, we try to do here at The Real News every week, whether we're talking about labor or the fight against the military industrial complex, the police and prison industrial complexes, so on and so forth. 
And I think that that's one of the many, many things that makes the reporting that Braden, Sarah, and Kim do so vital for, for all of us, right, is that they are out there every week lifting up these voices, paying attention to these struggles, giving people the nuance and context and firsthand uh, commentary that they desperately need to understand that these struggles are happening, why they're important, and what our role, all of us, is in advancing these struggles and being part of the struggle for better workplaces and ultimately a better world. And so without further ado, let's let's bring in our incredible panel and learn more from them and, and talk to them about the process of doing that work. Um, and I've tried to incorporate as many of the questions that folks submitted um, into the, the the panel discussion today. So we're going to try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, we got an hour down to the minute from now. So let's get rolling. So um, panel, with our first question, um, you know, we, we've got a lot of folks watching this stream right now who are asking themselves many of the same questions that you are going to respond to today. And many folks watching right now who are trying to find their own place in this changing media labor environment. And, you know, speaking for myself, I know that a lot of my own difficulties navigating this stuff early in my career kind of stemmed from my own misconceptions about the industry itself and the working lives of the journalists that I looked up to. You know, these are misconceptions that I developed largely by being, you know, an uninformed internet lurker, uh, only really observing things from the outside, projecting all kinds of assumptions, expectations, and, and insecurities onto these seemingly larger-than-life figures with blue check marks next to their Twitter handles. This was before the days of Elon Musk taking over Twitter. So I want to start there because I think before we can talk about how to improve and expand labor journalism, we need to demystify things a little bit and, and ground all of us here in a shared understanding of what this work actually is. And to many readers, followers, and fellow journalists who know you three through your work, uh, you all have that larger-than-life quality to some extent. So, so this is the icebreaker I wanted to start with. In your experience, what do people think labor journalism in general and your lives as labor journalists actually entails? And what do you most wish people understood about you, the work that you do, and the industry that we're doing this work in? So um, who wants to volunteer to go first? <laughs> um, I guess I can start. Um, I guess I'll just sort of briefly describe um, my, you know, work. So I'm at um, Law360, which is a kind of, you know, more niche publication or than either than you know Sarah and, and Kim routinely work for. But um, I you know cover the law and courts for an audience primarily of lawyers and my specific area is labor. Um, and so that means a lot of um, reading court briefs and a lot of talking to to lawyers and you know folks involved with the the labor movement as well. Um, I think kind of the you know image I think I have of the the labor reporter is like definitely a person embedded kind of you know out on the strike line and you know in the you know, the union halls and like, which frankly is like my image of, of Sarah and Kim, I guess, and, you know, not, and not so much like matching the work I do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the question being what, what wish people, people most understood. Um, yeah, it's tough. I mean, I guess, I guess that sort of just understand what goes in. I mean, I think you all you know, work here, know what it goes into a story, but sort of a lay person just as kind of, you know, knowing the process of how a story is made and identifying sources and, and good sources and, you know, building up those sources, I think is, is something that I wish, you know, I think generally this audience is going to know a lot more about that, but kind of for a general audience, I think, you know, a better understanding of kind of how the, the journalism sausage is made is, is sort of helpful. Um, but I think it's, yeah, I, I'll leave it at that, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I think the biggest misconception I come up against is that I have a job. Uh, I don't. <laughs> I'm mad freelance. <laughs> I have. I am lucky enough to do columns, like regular columns, at a couple places. But like every piece that I publish, I had to like hunter gather that shit. <laughs> like, 
um i think like like um as brain was saying there's just kind of a widespread like outside of our little bubble like a widespread kind of lack of understanding on on what journalism is like what media is how it happens what's going on like when i was uh when uh, the the biggest recent piece i've had come out was this investigation into the resurgence of black lung in central appalachia among younger coal miners and the primary subject john moore the person that i that i profiled in the piece he was really reticent to talk to me at first because he heard okay a journalist here wants to talk to you and he was like oh man like not my entire family doesn't know my diagnosis yet i'm not sure about that because he thought i was going to show up with a camera and put him on the evening news and i was like no i'm just going to put my phone in your face and you can tell me whatever you want to tell me like it is we can, and whatever you're comfortable with, like I'm on your side, I'm here for you, this is your story, I think, and maybe not every single journalist approaches it that way, which we can talk about later, but um, I think the, the fact that people and workers and vulnerable people are the, the, what, the, they're everything, they're where the stories come from and what the stories are about and they are in control or should be in control of how their stories are told, that's not necessarily an experience that everyone has when they engage with the media, because not everyone sees it like that. And I think that's something unique about labor journalism, about good labor journalism, is that you know what side you're on, you know how the story you're telling might impact people, real people, and you use that as a means to guide the way you approach the story. Um, also, people seem to think that journalists make money, which is very funny, because I mean, maybe if you're like, I wanted the fancy neo-fascist mainstream publications, but we're not out here like that. <laughs> yeah, what everybody said there, I think it's really funny still that um, the idea that like journalists are celebrities and we're kind of trapped in this terrible media ecosystem, especially as freelancers, um, where you have to constantly hustle and promote yourself and scramble and hunter gather that shit. I'm stealing that one, Kim, that's a great line. Um, and so we have to sort of simultaneously give the idea that we're doing great and super successful and also that we need work at all times. Um, and that living in that space is really weird and it's frankly like not good for journalism. Um, to be that insecure constantly, but to have like this projection onto you that you are doing great and that you're not the same on the same level as the people you write about. Like, you know, I write about working people. That means a lot of the people I write about make more money than I do. Um, you know, a union auto worker makes more than I do um, by a good bit. Um, <laughs> and is a hell of a lot more secure and has much better health insurance than I do. Um, the, but the real thing that I think I want people to take away about labor journalism, particularly when I'm talking to an audience of journalists, is that like this shit is hard. It's not just like talking to workers and absorbing their stories and carrying sometimes really difficult stories around with you, although it is that. Um, and it's not just memorizing 50 states different labor laws, although it is that. Um, it's fighting for respect in an industry that decided about 40 years ago that labor journalism didn't matter anymore. Um, and so constantly sort of watching publications hire people to be their new labor correspondent who you've never heard of. Um, and watching, um, you know, I, I had a New York Times reporter who um, her story was, you know, I wasn't gonna do this. Um, anyway, ask me after interviewing me for a story, if I could give her tips on how to do the job. And I was just like, well, you, you have a job at the New York Times and I'm freelance. So it's really not my job to teach you how to do your job. If you weren't qualified for it and I am, maybe they should have hired me in the first place. Um, you know, the, the idea that like labor journalism can be done very quickly and easily by anybody without a lot of practice or learning, um, but also, you know, that it's like somehow glamorous and rarefied. Like it's a beat like any other journalism beat. It requires specialized knowledge, building sources and a lot of hard, frustrating work. Sort of like most of the people we cover. Right. It, well, I mean, I think, and that's one of the reasons I really wanted to start there, right? Is because I, I, 
yeah thank you all for those really candid and and essential answers but um still even though we we can apply that kind of perspective to the stories we're reporting on it's very hard to sort of do the same to the industry that we're working in and and we still get so much of that yeah rarefied celebrity worship putting people on pedestals and and kind of associating visibility with with financial success or personal <laughs> success um and and i just wanted to to kind of communicate to all the folks out there watching folks freelancing folks just getting kind of started in this world right to to just pump the brakes and don't allow yourself to get swept into that you know, sort of high schoolish, you know, a uh, 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 race for clout, right? Um, you know, and 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 just sort of approach everything with a sort of humility, and and you know, try to approach folks in this world as fellow human beings, right? Because I think that's one of the the undersides that a lot of people don't see, and it can trickle out even to your your personal relationships. So the one thing I just wanted to sort of add is like. Even friends and family um, will associate your public visibility with uh, your your kind of ongoing success. They they make assumptions about what your daily life looks like, and they stop reaching out to you as much. And the, and I've had a lot of family say, "Oh well, we didn't want to bother you." And it's like, "Well, I'm I still miss my family, right? I still miss my friends, or I still like to talk to people about stuff that isn't work." But you can become sort of isolated when when people associate, um, you know, that visibility with with many other things. So, yeah, I just wanted us to, to kind of be real and frank there in the beginning that, you know, we're all hustling as best we can in an industry that has not made it easy for any of us to do this work and do it in a sustained way. You got some of the most incredible premier labor journalists in the country here who still have to hustle day in, day out to, to, to keep roofs over their heads, right? Let alone get those stories published, so on and so forth. So thank you all for, for those uh, answers. I want to um, kind of move into uh, the, the sort of title question for the description of this event, because I know that we're all dying to hear uh, you three answer that question, uh, which was written in the description of this event. And I quote, Movie and television writers are sticking to their pickets. The Screen Actors Guild voted overwhelmingly to authorize a strike, and a strike may be on the horizon for more than 350,000 UPS workers, the largest potential work stoppage uh, in U.S. history. So why is so much media coverage of strikes still so bad? <laughs> I mean, the short version is that newspapers, magazines, and the like don't actually hire people who's I, who are actually beat reporters, um, and they slap people on the story when something exciting happens. So the Amazon labor union wins an election, and suddenly everybody's a labor journalist. Um, but then two weeks later, they're not doing that. They're not following up. They're not still on that beat, right? Um, the New York Times bought out Steve Greenhouse and replaced him with somebody with much less experience on the beat, right? Like that's just the reality of the structure of the thing. And so people just don't know basic stuff and their boss has told them that they don't have to know basic stuff in order to do the job. see, and then Sarah is, I mean, she's the expert on this. She's been around longer than us and has seen this shit over and over again and it's i think it's just and it makes me so mad i think there is just less value placed on working people's stories on working class and poor people's stories and that filters into the way that editors look at the work that we do and that other people are doing to do labor reporting like oh it's just a general like anybody can write about that and that's why we hear every other week that the afl-cio is a union like the most basic shit and it's like it's it's insulting right like to us like to people that pour in our time and knowledge and like our, put our, our everything into this to sit or sit around and watch as major news publications that have a huge reach that impact lots of people that have a massive voice that have massive potential to be helpful they just assign away stories to people that don't care that much or don't know as much because they figure 
you know, well, this stuff isn't that hard. It's not complicated. It's just, oh, somebody's mad at their boss. Oh, that's an easy story. Let, like, there's probably no context. Like, I, I think there's probably more than a little bit of classism and various other isms invested in the way that this is approached. I mean, New York Times isn't gonna hire someone like me, even if I might know more about a certain subject, they're gonna hire some guy named Jeff who went to an Ivy League. That's how the system is set up. <laughs> I think I have a lot of uh, like simmering class rage about this in general, but I think that is the biggest crux of the matter. Like they don't think these stories are worth investing in. And as a result, everybody else suffers or is at least serves lower quality journalism or has their stories twisted or has their dirty laundry aired in a way that is harmful to the movement and not helpful to anybody. You, you have to give a shit. And if you don't give a shit, we can tell. <laughs> yeah, and I think I'll sort of add to all that. I think another big piece of it is just kind of like, you know, union stature in our society today. I mean, I think, you know, the better you know a subject, you know, your better your coverage is going to be. And like, you know, unions are just so diminished as an institution that, you know, everybody's got like a nurse or a teacher in the family who's, you know, a, a union member, but like so few people in this, you know, work have like been involved in the unions themselves. You know, I think I'm fortunate that, you know, when I came to Law 360 in 2016, right around the same time our organizing campaign was happening, um, I sort of got this job at the same time and became, you know, involved in that. So I saw our union drive happen. I, you know, they brought in the anti-union consultants, you know, we had our, you know, two year long, you know, contract campaign. We're now in the midst of, you know, our second, you know, contract uh, negotiation. I'm on the committee. And I think like that it's, it's hard to like substitute that experience to, to, with the institution to sort of understand um, this area. And yeah, there's just, there's, you know, so, so little of that, you know, I think it's, it's, is really cool to see there's been kind of a resurgence of attention here and there, and there are a lot of people who are kind of, you know, non experts parachuted in, but there have been, you know, an uptick in, you know, people who are, you know, staff or, you know, beat writers really like drilling in. I think you've seen some improvements to the coverage in kind of the last few years when there's been more of that, you know, and I think just hopefully, you know, this, this attention continues and the people who are, you know, sort of new, new on the beat can kind of continue building that, you know, experience and expertise. Cause yeah, there's really no substitute for, for doing it and seeing it as far as learning. So. Hell yeah. And, you know, I think like one other point that was that was kind of implied in, in a lot of what y'all said is that, you know, uh, when when labor stories do make it into, you know, a more mainstream publication um, with a wide reach, all the standard problems that we have with a lot of those publications, you know, still apply. Right. So like uh the the story of struggle uh for people struggling to you know afford to keep a roof over their heads right or to have proper ppe when they're risking their lives and their families lives by going into a covid hot spot to work right or people who are trying to exercise their democratic right to organize in the workplace that gets sucked into the same sort of both sides um you know uh, uh belief that um, to have credibility, the reporter needs to just sort of lay out the issue, talk to the boss, talk to a, a union rep. There you go. That's that's kind of an even handed sort of reporting uh, a report on like this struggle. Um, but I think that, like Kim said, it's like we can tell if you don't give a shit, because I think that what's what's really starting to emerge out of like this sort of resurgence of of interest in labor reporting is people who are less afraid to sort of acknowledge that uh, we take as a first principle that workers uh, deserve better than what they're currently getting, right? And we take as first principle that it is our right to organize in the workplace and people who are violating those rights are in the wrong. We don't have to pretend otherwise in our reporting. Like we can still apply the tools of rigorous, honest, principled journalism uh, to a cause that we believe in because we believe on that first principle level that working people have a right to better than what they're currently getting. Um, I want to sort of, we're going to sort of dig into maybe like some specific examples in a, in a second, but I wanted to follow up on that question with with one that 
uh, was submitted in, in a n- number of forms, um, number of variations on the same question in, in the RSVPs um, that I think is really important to sort of hover on. Um, you know, not many publications, as y'all have acknowledged, invest in labor journalism, which means that it's often done by freelancers and staffers at smaller publications. How do the precarious working conditions of labor journalists that we mentioned in the beginning, how do those impact coverage of strikes and unions and other stories involving worker struggle? And I guess conversely, how does being a union member or having experience organizing impact the way that you think about and report on labor? Um, yeah, when I started trying to be a labor reporter, um, there were even fewer people doing it than there are now. Um, and it was a constant struggle to convince even the kinds of places that now regularly run pretty good labor coverage that it mattered. And what has happened in that time is I started trying to do this stuff kind of full-time in like 2009. Um, And then since then, there have been sort of big, exciting labor events that made publications go, oh, um, you know, who do we get that knows about this shit, basically? Um, Call Sarah, she knows what a union is, right? Um, And that is how I managed to get somewhere. And through that time, um, I had a few full-time jobs at that point in time. Um, that I no longer have. And I, it, next year will be my 10 year anniversary of being full-time freelance. Um, and it is really hard um, because the thing that I've, I've finally sort of realized after 10 years of being freelance is that what I can do best with these working conditions is feature stories. Um, that actually maybe pays me enough to eat and um, it has a long enough sort of planning period that I can um, work on something. I can pitch it to an editor, work on it with that editor, whatever. Um, In that kind of frame, I mean, that and writing books, because trying to do a news story as a freelancer is basically impossible unless somebody sort of commissions you to do it. Right, like I've had somebody like the nation sent me to LA to do the teacher strike in 2019. But most of the time, if you're trying to pitch a news story and it's breaking news, Um, and you're freelance, you're calling editors, you're waiting for them to get back to you, they're on their own schedule, they maybe don't realize that the thing is as important as you do, because it's your beat, and that's why you're the expert in it. Um, And it has disastrous effects sometimes for the story. Um, So one of the things, though, that has been really, really, really helpful, in addition to just like labor becoming more of a prominent force in American politics again, um, is also that reporters have been unionizing and reporters have been unionizing at publications that are not necessarily the ones that are commissioning labor stories. So, you know, when Bustle unionizes, suddenly you've got a whole bunch of people who work at a mostly, you know, pop culture site targeting young women who know what right to work means because their boss tried to stick it in the contract, right? Um, And that level of basic knowledge through experience has actually changed Um, some of the conditions that we work under, not only under like people um, knowing what stories have value and and understanding more when I say like, this is important because of X, just, you know, um, but also that they're more willing and more able as unionized employees to sort of fight for the rights of freelancers too. And then the organizing that's been going on among freelancers to set our own standards, um, you know, it's, it's, changed the structure of the thing and also I think had a really positive impact on the reporting so that's like a really good feedback loop so if anybody on here is a reporter and not yet unionized um we'd love to talk to you about that oh Sarah is so I'm so glad that Sarah brought that up I mean that that wave that the that kicked off in 2015-2016 with Rose Group of America East my union and the News Guild started organizing the hell out of digital media like i was part of that wave when i was at vice that's how i ended up here that's how i ended up here i was a heavy metal editor forever and ever which is why i look like this and being involved in organizing learning 
firsthand what it was like to organize and bargain and go to the beer hall and argue over minutia and a contract and make friends with labor lawyers, just everything that comes with it that a lot of you folks know about now because you've been through the same process and you've probably also gotten laid off and gone to new publications and talk to your friends there about unionizing. It's like, I think of it like blowing a, like dandelion seeds, right? A lot of, we get laid off all the fucking time and then we land at new publications and we start organizing there or we're freelance and we start organizing in that capacity. Like they keep trying to chop us off at the, at the head, but we still have those roots. And I think that is great. But in terms of the way that being freelance and the general precarity that comes with doing this work, the way that we do it, I think one thing that makes me sad is that the lack of funding and support means that so many stories don't get told because good journalism costs money. Like let alone paying someone a living wage to do the work, you have to often go somewhere and talk to people and stick around for a little while. You know, it's, you can just walk up to the picket line, talk to three people, write a quick blog and be done with it, but you're not going to get anything good. You know, my, it's my most potent experience with all that, which Max knows a lot about because he helped facilitate me, enable me, some might say, is spending the two years reporting on one strike in Alabama, a coal miner strike that's still, it's still kind of like an ellipsis instead of a period. But in order to go down there, that was a story that most editors didn't really care about because it was complicated. The characters weren't necessarily as sympathetic as other characters could have been, but it was important. And so I found, I pitched so many different angles, so many different places. I got little reporting grants. I worked with publications like The Real News that will actually give you a little bit of money to report on things. You should really pitch them. Um, I, I did everything I could to continue covering this story. And if I had been a staff writer, that could have been like a beautiful sprawling magazine piece like one piece that I spent six months on. And instead I just hustled my ass off and I did what I could do. And I think a lot of us are in that position where a lot of the work we do could be a beautiful cover story or a documentary or just a really good feature. But who has the time, who has the money? What editor is gonna give you license to do that with something? It's rare and it's precious and it shouldn't be that rare. And when you're freelance, it's so much harder to just get your claws into those resources because, oh, if someone on staff just send them instead they're already on salary it's just the the value proposition or whatever like the calculus they're making is the story worth it? is this person worth it i think that hurts us and that hurts the movement and the coverage we're able to generate because like people don't like spending money on things in general especially not workers and especially not precarious workers so that's something that sticks with me a lot i think i answered most of the question i think this is, is braden's time now uh, sure, I can I can take this one. Yeah, I think you guys did you know, a great job discussing the you know precarity and like being a freelance reporter on this one. You know, I'm I'm staff. You know, I I'm not you know some I I don't I'm not enough of a hustler to as you said, Kim. You know, hunter gather that shit. So I'm I'm uh you know I, I, you know hanging on the staff here, so I can't speak to that world. But I guess in terms of you know the question of you know how does being a union member you know, impact the way I think about and report on labor? I mean, again, I think it's. You know, that opportunity to like really have the experience and have like gone through all these things myself that you know I also report on, um, which is you know it, it's hard to you can't really overstate how beneficial that is. But I think like you know one of the things that like enables to do is like even more so the understanding is like I can speak to sources from a place of like having done the things they're you know going through in whether that's you know workers themselves or you know union reps and officials or you know lawyers who i talk to routinely kind of like talking through these like things i've done i can mention i've done that it's really helpful to kind of establish that sort of familiarity um but yeah i think if you have any other aspects of you know, how does being a union member impact the way i think i mean i think yeah just really that that sort of understanding and like really sort of understanding labor and, and unions as you know institutions made up of you know workers not some like vague you know monolithic institution but like a bunch of people sort of like coming together to like work towards their idea and like work it out and just sort of like that sort of understanding i think has been something i've you know gotten from you know being being a member of myself and seeing it happen oh yeah so i i really really appreciate all those answers because i think they yeah give like important sort of tangible examples right of the effects that that the political economy of this 
industry such that it is in directly impacts us and directly impacts the reporting that we do. Uh, and I know that folks watching and listening, you know, y'all have felt this uh, yourselves to, to, you know, many extents. And I, I would just say that um, it was very eye opening to me coming to the real news network and getting to um, have a staff, you know, permanent staff position as now the editor in chief and, and getting to sort of, see the the labor reporting world from that side and just realize how much power other editors at other publications have to influence these kinds of things that they don't fucking use pardon my french which like drives me nuts right so even just having this position instead of being a freelancer meant first and foremost Okay, I I have more power now to say like we're gonna keep following up on this story. We're gonna keep sending Kim down to Brookwood, Alabama because it's important, and also like it's not just a one-off thing. Like even after the initial headlines about the strike fade uh, into the collective memory hole, those folks are still on strike, right? They're still there. They're still holding the line. They're still figuring out how they're gonna buy their kids Christmas presents come winter right? They're still trying to negotiate a fair contract. And so it's important to sort of keep that story uh, in the collective memory. And I really want to give a shout out to Kim, who's as a freelancer did more than like any single journalist alive to lift up the warrior met coal strike over the past two years. That's a, and I saw how hard she worked on that. And I'm very grateful to her for that. And I know how hard all you freelancers work and I've done it myself. Um, and it would be great if we had more institutional support because we can do more and better and, and more extensive coverage. So even just doing those follow-ups is really important. The other thing I would say is that um, getting to be on this side of things, I remember very well how many times I got dicked over by publications with my payment, right? That impacts your reporting, right? If you have to wait until a publication publishes the damn thing before it starts processing your payment, then you're going to put a premium on getting the story out, even if there are questions that you want to investigate more, even if there are more people you want to talk to, you're going to become victim to that same sort of uh, uh, news cycle. And the, so the stories may inevitably suffer from that. And so, you know, I think that other publications do have the ability to at least get folks um, some of their money up front or like when a draft is submitted and approved, like give people the ability to keep drilling down on this story and get it to where they want to be without worrying about how they're going to pay rent. You know, that's, I think that's one thing that, that other publications can do. And last thing, just to kind of uh, highlight what, what folks said is that union journalism is better journalism, right? I can say like the real news is a proud union shop and it, it benefits just like you see the union logo on all the products, you know, that like, you know, the, the, the Kellogg's products that, that, you know, um, the, the, uh, union members make here in the States, they put it on there because they're proud of it. They want you to know that this has been made with the kind of high level of union craftsmanship that you come to expect. The same applies to journalism. Um, you know, I can't like submit a labor story to my union staff and like, they're going to call me on it if like, we're not practicing our principles here at The Real News, or they're going to be looking at the story from that angle. And it makes the story Better. And so I think that that's, um, you know, really, really important facet to all of this. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, I thought my internet crapped out. I had like a, a existential nightmare. Okay. Next question. <laughs> so we're still here. Um, so I want to drill down on um, some, some examples here, like stuff that, that folks watching and listening can, can uh, learn from and adopt in their own reporting. Um, I wanted to ask if we could go back around the table and sort of talk about some general tropes or, or you know, pitfalls, like just some, some examples of bad labor reporting and the consequences of bad labor reporting that stick out in your heads. And, um, you know, what, what should the opposite look like? What are examples maybe in your own work that you feel is sort of pushing against those um, bad trends that you see in other corners of the the media ecosphere um and get it get as wonky about your own reporting as you'd like um sure i guess i can i can lead this one off for like have a bit relative rotation here i guess i can you know take that you know invitation to get wonky and kind of talk about the nlrb a little bit which is like the bread and butter of, you know what i cover and 
you know, Amazon and, and Starbucks and all these other big campaigns, you know, going on um, have, you know, they, they run, have run into the NLRB a lot. Um, and a lot of the coverage sort of gets the broad strokes right, but, you know, misses kind of some of the finer points at times. You know, for example, I think, you know, the, the NLRB itself is sort of, it's an agency with two sides. You know, you have the general counsel, you know, who acts as sort of the prosecutor and investigates and bring cases. And then the board, which is the entity that actually decides cases. And a lot of people kind of conflate the action of the general counsel as the prosecutor with, you know, the board as deciding things. And, you know, you see this litigation against, you know, Amazon and, and, and Starbucks. And there actually hasn't been a decision by the board, really, at least, regarding those campaigns. It's all been things by the prosecutors and judges and preliminary stuff. Um, and then I think another piece is kind of, you know, putting sort of in perspective where these sort of like legal milestones fit in the bigger picture. You know, I think, as, you know, as, as long as both the Starbucks and, you know, Amazon and all these other you know, public campaigns have been going on for, you know, two, three years now, like as long as they would seem to be on, you know, they're still in their infancy as far as the legal aspects go. And so, you know, there's going to be a judge's decision, there's going to be the board's going to rule, and then it's only going to go you know, to an appeals court. And it's only after an appeals court rules on a case that it's sort of a, a final thing and has impact. Um, and then you know, I think I think sort of one thing that I'd say on that point is that sort of these you know, these steps should be sort of framed as you know preliminary rather than end themselves when when the board or a judge rules or even you know a prosecutor brings a case sort of viewing the long picture. Um, and then sort of you know when it comes to you know, actually negotiating a contract, you know, I think, and this is something that I think a lot of the coverage gets well, but sort of, you know, what the NLRB says and does, you know, the NLRB kind of, you know, calls balls and strikes, but, you know, organizing, negotiating contracts, like that happens in the actual workplace. Um, so don't sort of overstate the importance of the structure to that, but as well as sort of keeping in perspective that again, like this is a, a long-term thing and, you know, it's, it's one thing for, you know, Starbucks and Amazon, you know, those are the big examples going on. It's, it's, it's one thing for them to, you know, sort of form a union that's a big achievement in itself but like that's that's so far from getting to a contract which is like really you know what is sort of the the focal point of you know, organizing right that's what confers the benefits and like i think sort of keeping that whole thing in perspective is is sort of you know these individual events and sort of where they fit in the broader picture i think is really important to good reporting kind of contextualizing that so i'll give it to the other panelists now I want to hear what Sarah has to say first. I know Sarah has a lot to say. <laughs> Whatever do you mean? <laughs> yeah, I was just writing in my notebook. Um, I've been threatening a lot lately to get tell no lies, claim no easy victories tattooed across my chest. Um, and I'm probably not actually going to do that, but I think about it a lot because I think one of the things that's happened a lot lately is I find myself, um, and I'm sort of biting one of the questions that we may not get to that I know is on the list. Um, rather than being like an excited cheerleader for everything, I'm often like the one who's trying to tell people to like slow their roll a little bit because now things are really exciting, right? And as sort of as Braden was just saying, like people win an NLRB election, which is stunning achievement on its own considering how stacked that process is against workers right now. Um, and then it's like, woohoo, everything's done now. This is great. This is amazing. And, and everything's going to be magical and ponies now, right? No, no, it's not. No, it's really not. There's a whole bunch of other hell that you're going to go through over the next two to three years. Uh, the average union contract takes around two years to achieve. Um, and like, so like details like that, like just the, the sense of the thing born from watching it happen a lot, um, the context that these things fit into in the historical sort of space that they're in, like we're in an interesting place in sort of political history now. I'm sitting here and I'm talking to you from London and in the US and in England, we both had these sort of um, left-wing sort of moonshots with Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn, these people who come out of nowhere and are talking about class, I mean, not out of nowhere, they've both been in, you know, parliament and in Congress for a very long time, but like suddenly they're national figures and they're running for, you know, good to possibly lead the country and, and they're talking about class and, oh my God, this is really exciting. And we've got a lot of people who are excited about the idea of class and therefore they're excited about the idea of unions but it's not the reality of unions and it's not the sort of already existing things that are both sort of 
you know, actually existing um, collections of collectives of working people working together, and also bureaucratic structures that have long histories, um, finances, property, ownership over, um, you know, all sorts of things, um, corruption scandals, leadership fights, all of this stuff going on in there. And so there's a lot of sort of woohoo out there that like, I am as excited as anybody in the world when there is a new union win in a field that hasn't been there. But I kind of want to tell people like, we need to get to the hundredth Amazon warehouse, not the first. We, we're at like the 200 and something Starbucks, which is great, but none of them have a contract yet. Like, so I am find myself a lot of the time saying like, okay guys but we have to like have some understanding of like the real context that we're fighting in which is still stacked against us even though in a lot of ways it looks brighter than it ever has in my lifetime and i'm 43 years old oh, i really should never follow sarah in anything but i will just say <laughs> uh, obviously everything they said is they're right duh um, but something that I suppose personally sticks in my craw, I, I alluded to it, alluded to it earlier, and there's 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 a recent piece that I'm sure a bunch of people read, and I'm sure there's more tempered criticisms to be made, but I don't like seeing dirty laundry aired just because just because you know some unflattering things or uninspiring things about a union leader or a union campaign. I think it is important to sit with that for a minute and think, okay, I have this information. What good will it do if I put it out in the world? Will this harm the movement? Will this harm this person's credibility? What like what impact will this have? And is it worth it? And obviously, like, yeah, if someone's being awful, that should be called out. But when it comes to internal union politics and internal union machinations, some of it. I don't know, man. Some of it isn't necessarily the rest of the world's business that they don't understand the context or what is happening or how everything fits together. I think about some like I've I've been on a lot of picket lines, I've talked to a lot of workers, I've reported on a lot of strikes and conflicts, and not everyone is a little angel all the time. I've seen some things, I know some things. Is it helpful to put those things out in the world? No. Am I taking some stuff to my grave? Yeah. If I had reported it at the time, would that have helped anybody but the boss? No. And I mean, those are the, some of the calculations I make. I'm being a little vague. And thankfully, I'm like a reported op-ed kind of gal, so I don't have to pretend to be objective. But that is something that, that always sticks out to me when I see big labor stories that seem sort of mean or dismissive or classist or racist or homophobic. Like, you just, just think about what you're trying to do and who it's for and who it helps and who it hurts the most. That is just a little piece of advice I put out there for my other extremely biased reporters. Well, and I wanna like, so we got a little time left and I wanna kind of keep this conversation going, right? Cause it, as Sarah mentioned, this does bleed over into the next question, which was, you know, uh, what folks who RCP like really wanted some advice on. And I think y'all have started to to give exceedingly helpful advice in this regard. Um, and yeah, like, I think like we can't be naive, uh, not that anyone here is being that, but I mean, I'm, I'm addressing this to everyone watching and listening, right? We can't be naive in, in thinking that what we write, what we publish, what we put out there in the world, as Kim was saying, like doesn't have an impact on the, the story that we're reporting on. Right. You know, like I think that uh, we all sort of understand that to some extent. There's a there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that role. Um, and I think that, um, as Sarah said, right, um, I also see, you know, a lot of the sort of progressive energy uh, that really sort of rose up through and expressed itself through the Bernie Sanders campaign, the Jeremy Corbyn campaign. Um, and when those sort of like political movements were more or less crushed, the, the hope that I think a lot of us had for that progressive change sort of like got dumped into things like the labor movement. Um, and, and I think you've seen a lot of great sort of results coming from that, a lot of rank and file energy, a lot of like younger folks getting involved, people, you know, public favorability for unions higher than ever. Great. Like we said, that's all, that's all well and good. 
Um, but I think if people don't have, as our panel here is saying, like a realistic understanding of what this world looks like, what its issues are, what the realities of labor law are, you know, the realities of an organizing campaign, um, they can have, you know, very inflated expectations of what the labor struggle looks like. And then they're going to quickly recede or, or come to quick, uh, uh, unfair conclusions about that movement um, if they don't see what they want to see from it you know uh, as as everyone here is saying right it's not that like unions don't have problems don't have corruption scandals don't have undemocratic practices don't have histories of concessionary bargaining yada 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 but i think about something that uh in in sarah's neck of the woods uh, uh clayton clive a member of the rmt union up in manchester told me in a recent interview he said you know unions aren't perfect but my union is the most democratic thing that I engage with in my life. If I have problems with it, I can run for office, right? I can I can be part of the change to make the union what it's supposed to be. I can't really do that with my, you know, political MPs or like the party, the Democratic Party. They don't listen to me, right? I can't really do that with the companies that are screwing me over like from Netflix to to BP, right? They don't listen to me. Like unions are still at least more of a democratic arena of engagement that regular working people can, you know, participate in and be part of fixing. And I think that that's an important thing to sort of hold on to. But still, for folks who are reporting on this, there are a lot of hairy questions that y'all have already started to address. And I wanted to just throw some more at you in the time that we have left, because folks were asking us, you know, how do you balance investment in wanting to see the labor movement succeed and wanting working people to win their struggles. How do you balance that with being realistic about the labor movement's weaknesses and, and challenges as a journalist? And how should say like new labor journalists, like how should they navigate and understand their relationship to unions? Um, and another kind of question you, you guys can take whichever one of these like you're most interested in. Don't Please don't feel like you have to answer all of them. But the last one was like, what role, if any, can labor journalism play in that labor movement politics y'all were talking about of, of trying to push unions in more progressive, less conservative, more inclusive, you know, uh, um, directions? Like what role do you feel that you play in those sort of internal movement politics? So again, take whatever is useful there, leave whatever's not. <laughs> So I'm the one who has to leap off it exactly um, in exactly 10 minutes. So I'm going to jump in here first, if that's okay. Um, the thing that I always end up saying whenever I'm on any sort of panel about journalism is that every decision that you make as a journalist is political. Every story that you choose to cover or choose not to cover, everyone that you choose to interview in that story, everything that you put out there in the world, those are political choices. They have repercussions, they have ramifications, sometimes big, sometimes not big, right? Um, it depends on what it is. You often don't know what will be the thing that you write that blows up. Um, and so, yeah, that means that we take seriously the responsibility, or we should anyway, take seriously the responsibility that you're putting in our hands if you were trusting me with your story. Um, a thing I learned in journalism school, which um, a lot of journalists don't seem to take seriously, but I did, um, is that there are sort of two sets of rules in the media for your average person and then for public figures. Um, that means that uh, your average working person who is in their shop trying to organize a union or a member of a union deserves to be treated like they didn't ask for a damn reporter to show up on their doorstep because they didn't. Um, and that's a different set of questions, a different ways you treat them, um, different responsibility that you take with what they told you than somebody who is in a position of power, which is to say either the boss or in some cases, right, union leadership. Um, union leadership does have a responsibility to answer questions from reporters. They do, I'm sorry. Um, they have that responsibility to their members, but they also do have a responsibility to take my calls. Um, and if they don't, I'm going to have questions. Um, that's a different way to understand things than just like, I am on the side of everybody who's fighting for the working class, which is true, right? But like when people are screwing up, right? The, the UAW has a new leadership now after a really ugly corruption scandal, right? And there is nothing to be gained by pretending that that corruption scandal didn't happen. 
because what actually happened is as a result of that, people within the union organized, they made the union more dem democratic, right? They put, they instituted a one member, one vote structure, and now they've put in a new leadership that has a different approach to organizing and a different approach to running the thing. And we'll see how that works. Um, Alex Press had a really good piece about that, actually the new leadership of the UAW that everyone should read. Um, because we have to think on, because, and she did that thing really well that I was talking about before of grappling with the reality of this thing, the structural challenges that the people are up against trying to organize in factories when companies want to close the factory down and move it somewhere else where the workers are more exploitable. Um, that kind of thing, again, I think being really honest about the conditions that you're in is not the same as airing dirty laundry or doing a gotcha story or undermining people because like you can, um, you know, the, the kind of thing that you see sometimes um, in political stories, in electoral politics stories, you know, you can do the same thing to, to union leadership, you can do that same thing to your average worker. Um, and I just, I think it's really important to tell the truth um, I, that's a, a, you know, really corny thing to say, but I wouldn't be a journalist if I didn't believe it. Um, but that's only like one part of the question of the decisions that you make when you decide what you're going to put out there, where, when, how, um, and always why, right? So it's, I would be lying if I said I could give you an easy set of rules. These are calculations that I make every time I write something. What is the point of this? Do I know what I'm talking about here? Um, did I talk to the right people? Did I talk to enough people? And where is this being published? Who's gonna read it? Um, this is like this math that lives in my brain. Um, and I think that that's true of probably most reporters in, on most subjects, right? Is that you're making a series of calculations based on what you know um, like just as a, not even as a political practice, but just as a general point of whatever, we only publish a tiny, tiny fraction of what we know, right? I'm, I'm working on an outline for a book chapter right now, and the, the outline for the chapter is now 100 pages long. That book chapter is not going to be 100 pages long, but that's just like the thing, and then you sort of carve it into the shape of a story. So while doing the carving, this is where all of those questions get um, answered and they change from story to story. Um, and I think that's natural. And I, I kind of, to make this very, very short and shut up now, um, it's hard and it should be hard to do that well. Um, I guess I can hop in here. Um, so I'll say, you know, about Law 360, um, you know, our audience is, you know, both, you know, union and, you know, management side lawyers. So our, you know, coverage is, you know, neutral and we could talk for, for days about like what neutrality means in the context of reporting. I guess like from where I come from, I guess what that means is you know, I'm a union member. I have reaped, you know, significant benefits, you know, from, from that and our contract and the contract we're negotiating now has made, you know, Law 360 in a measurably you know, better place to work. Um, and so I'd have to, you know, also sort of keep a detachment though from my own experience and sort of the you know the broader you know labor movement and sort of kind of think critically. I mean I think there's a, I think there's an instinct to see you know unions you know kind of like a David to you know management's Goliath and you know as the good guys we have to keep in mind that these are you know human institutions and have their you know flaws and failures while also recognizing that they are you know worker advocacy institutions at bottom. Um, but I think we have to you know really kind of strive to cover them you know accurately and fairly and truthfully. And I think you know one of the animating principles that I kind of try to keep in mind when I'm doing you know, anything is to sort of, you know, focus, you know, if whatever I'm covering, you know, a, a court decision or a new you know, lawsuit or whatever is sort of, you know, focus on the implications to an individual worker, you know, in a union or organizing a worker of, you know, what that is that's happening. And I think that's sort of really helpful for kind of, you know, cutting through, you um, any of these, you know, layers here is to really sort of like drill down into like what is the actual impact on, you know, a person who is organizing a union, who's like in a union negotiating their contract. I think that's like, you know, really helpful for, you know, doing good coverage of, of this stuff. And I think, you know, again, you know, for covering movement issues and the like, it's sort of, you know, being being very focused and elevating the individual, I think is really important. Yeah, I've just been over here sort of chewing on what everyone else is saying and trying to figure out what I have to add. So I'm so uh, I'm I'm kind of feral when it comes to these things. I haven't been I don't have any like formal training on these things. I've kind of picked it up as I've gone along and learned from people, 
like Sarah and like from Steven and just other people have done this work for a long time on how you should approach it, what to do, what not to do. And I do have a tendency to be a big Pollyanna about these things and be very protective of the stories and the people that I'm that I'm covering and I care about. But yeah, some not their unions are messy, union members are messy, they're not a monolith. You're gonna come across stuff that's ugly that does need to be made public, that is part of the story, that's part of the context. You just have to make those decisions, like Sarah said, like you have to do that calculus and do that math and try and hope you come out with the right answer. And when it comes to a role that labor journalism can play in pushing some of these more conservative unions or their leaders in any kind of way, I mean, Lord knows you can try. Uh, you can piss them off real bad by talking about cops and about how they shouldn't be in the labor movement. Will they pay attention to you? Maybe. Will they ignore you and blacklist you? Maybe. Uh, I guess I'll find out. But <laughs> I, I think, I mean, labor journalism has a lot of power so even if in that specific case, we're still figuring out how to really get those nudges to land, I think there is so much power in the work that we do just by bringing these stories out into the public eye and empowering those workers, making them feel like, yeah, your struggle matters, your experience, your life fucking matters. Like it's, yeah, maybe I'm just being a Pollyanna again. I guess I've had such a, <laughs> oh, my, my, my role or my experience as a labor journalist has been a little unorthodox, right? Like I went from just being a heavy metal editor, writer person forever, and then fell into the labor world and fell in love with it. And I've tried to learn as much as I can and do as good a job as I can. But I think like a lot of journalists who cover this beat, I still have a lot to learn, right? Like I am still trying to do the best I can with what I have and to pull in as my many new skills, as much new knowledge as I possibly can, because I think this is kind of a like a sacred burden in a way, right? Like if you have the privilege to be able to have a platform and an opportunity to tell these workers stories, you cannot afford to fuck it up because it matters. And I think that's just something to keep in mind when you're looking at these stories, looking at how you want to approach them. Like this is these are people's lives in a way that's very intimate and very personal. You know, every every as I think Sarah and a lot of people said every story is a labor story. There's always that angle and it's always important to keep that in mind. Like this is someone's life. You're having an impact on their day to day in a way that other types of reporting don't always have. And you owe it to them. You owe it to them, not to any union leader, to any union. You owe it to the people themselves to do a good job. And so Sarah has to leave in four seconds. And given the title of this, I would ask Sarah, why don't we say union boss? Because the union, the leadership of the union is no more your boss than your member of Congress is your boss. They are elected leadership and they are very different things than the boss. And union boss is a term that actual bosses have put out there because they really, really, really like to make it sound like the union is trying to do the same thing to you that the boss is, but that's not true. Even the worst union elected leadership is as your dude at the RMT said, um, elected leadership, even the most undemocratic union, you still have ways to get rid of them. And now you have to get rid of me. Goodbye guys, I gotta go. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sarah. Bye. What um, an exit. <laughs> what an exit yeah oh, i think um, so she's the og beautifully put by all of you um and and i would just uh one one thing that i was thinking of that that i would want to also add for any folks out there who again are watching because you want to get into doing this work or maybe you're starting to do this work uh and you want to grow your ability to do it more consistently um you're trying to find your place in this you know media ecosystem the other thing I would just add, and I think that this is really just sort of picking up on what Kim Braden and Sarah have already put down, is please do not mistake your public visibility as a journalist for your role as a speaker for these movements, right, or leader of these movements, right? This is a very tantalizing, seductive sort of incentive that you get in a media ecosystem that puts such a high premium on public visibility, right? You can start to convince yourself because people are hitting you up 
to to talk about these stories and to do interviews about them, you can start to convince yourself that you yourself are, you know, among the leaders of this movement. And I would say, like, you have to be very honest about with yourself about what you want your role to be. Do you want to be a journalist? Do you want or do you want to be a propagandist? Like, do you want um, you know, to to be, yeah, I guess like a public speaker about labor, right? Or you, you can't have it all. You got to, you got to, you know, I think that the, a lot of people can kid themselves into having it all. And then like their work starts to suffer, they start to overstep. Um, but I think if you keep yourself honest about what that role is, it's, uh, it's really, really important as you continue to do this work. Because for me, there are plenty of times where people ask me, about my opinion on like, say, you know, I was reporting on the railroads all last year. And then people were asking me like what I thought the different, you know, leaderships of the 12 different craft unions on the freight rail system should have done at this point in the timeline. And I kind of had to say this, like, you know, I got a lot of opinions about it, but it's not my fucking place, right? To be out here and, and telling these unions what to do. I'm not a member of these unions, right? And also, it's not my job to, as Kim said, just use my publication to sort of air dirty laundry uh, in a way that is not productive in helping the union solve its own problems. There are plenty of times where you got to pass on a story because it's a conversation that needs to be had internally with members of that union or members of that organizing committee. Not everything needs to be blasted out on Twitter and fought over, you know, in public. We need to have spaces where people can work their shit out in less high stakes, high visibility circumstances. So that, again, is just being honest about the role that media play in the politics of the movement that we cover. Um, and uh, last thing, just like rapid fire, Sarah had to leave, but I guess are there any like 30 second uh, messages that uh, Kim or Braden that you had uh, about the importance of uh, journalists, photographers, editors, videographers, like folks in this industry, any final messages you want to share with them about the importance of organizing themselves as workers? Yeah, I mean, I guess I can go. I mean, I think, you know, obviously, you know, it's important to, you know, advocate for yourselves and, you know, get yourself, you know, the best a lot you can. And this is, you know, offers a great, you know, way to do that. For sure. Um, I guess one thing I wanted to I sort of take this as a kind of a catch all thing, just to close out my my piece, I wanted to mention that I forgot to earlier that, you know, I talked about sort of the, you know, wonky legal stuff. Um, if anybody here who's watching this ever like runs into that stuff and you know has questions, I'm happy to help another reporter understand like a very wonky area of coverage and like my, you know, DMs are are open if you want to find me on Twitter. Um, but, but yeah, I guess that's my sort of piece here. But I think, yeah, I think, you know, you're all doing you know, important work and sort of the, the first step is is starting and you guys being here and kind of, you know, listening to, to us speak, I think is, you know, going to be, you know, helpful to informing your own reporting as you go on your careers. And I'm going to completely ignore Max's question, uh, though, obviously you should organize, organize fucking everything, organize your block, organize your workplace, organize your family, figure it out. Um, but what I want to say is because I realized that uh, we've said a lot about what not to do and what fucking up looks like and why this is so important and life threatening and like you cannot, you can't blow it. But I don't want to scare you off from doing it because you can do it. Like we need more labor reporters. We need more good people with experience with organizing, with experience with labor, with experience as working class people. They didn't grow up all fancy to do this work because that's that's what we've been talking about this whole time we need to get these worker stories out there we need to get our stories out there because journalism is just another fucking job and as we know a lot of time it sucks <laughs> that's why we're organizing that's why we're here um, i just want to be a little bit of a cheerleader right now and really encourage people who are interested in doing these stories to do them to write them maybe take a little extra time to reach out to experts you know, people that know a little bit more about it or can handle the wonky stuff or can help you figure out how to not be uh, just a total op-ed monster like I am, but you should do it. Like everybody who is interested should try and work on being a labor reporter or writing labor stories. There's no barrier to entry. I spent my entire life in tour vans writing about heavy metal bands and then I helped organize my workplace. And now I am a labor reporter that people ask to come on to panels to talk to other reporters. So like, 
it worked out. I'm just some fucking guy. So if I can figure this out, you can totally do it. And we want you to, and we welcome you. And we love you for trying, even if you mess up a little bit, we'll figure it out together because that's who we are as journalists, as freelancers, as organizers, as working class people. It's us against them. And if we have the opportunity to tell our own stories, we got to make sure we take it because fuck them. Beautiful, perfect spot for us to end on. Couldn't have said it better myself. I want to thank the incredible Kim Kelly, Braden Campbell, and Sarah Jaffe for being so generous with their time and expertise over the past hour. I want to thank again everyone who tuned in to watch this live stream. And of course, a huge, huge thank you to the National Writers Union, the News Guild, the Writers Guild of America East, the Freelance Solidarity Project, Labor Notes, and everyone involved in making this event a reality. Thank you so, so much uh, for watching. Thank you for caring. This is Maximilian Alvarez from the Real News Network signing off. As Kim said, let's go get them. We got a lot of work to do.